Oh, yeah, that'll work great. I was going to suggest using an intern, but. <laughs> Only the kind with the flat top on their head, right? Yeah, well, that's the best kind of intern. See? Well, second best. Best kind is an intern who doesn't call OSHA. Call reporters who do that. Yeah. Okay. Howdy, y'all. Uh, my name is Travis Goodspeed. Today we're going to be talking about how to build your own hard disk with anti-forensics built in. Um, actually, my presentation remote is an anti-forensics hard disk, and we'll get to that in a bit. Um, this began with a... Was, if that's my phone, I'm going to be embarrassed. So this began with an investigation into USB. Um, you know how USB supports every... USB, uh, how Linux supports every USB device ever manufactured except for the wireless card in your individual laptop? Well, no, think about this for a second. That's a shitload of devices, and they all have different drivers. And those drivers are kind of like servers in that they're running weird services that you can connect to externally. And you can exploit those. So we began making a, um, an anti, uh, we began making a USB research tool, the Face Dancer which we used to emulate USB devices. And then we began to emulate hard disks, and we began to pay attention to the weird stuff that you can do with hard disks. Um, this is related to work that I've done with Sergey Bratis and the Scooby crew at Dartmouth um, in the Face Dancer project, as well as to um, work that Colin Mulliner has done in reprogramming a Nokia N900 to do time of check to time of use attacks against a Samsung television. So you can actually jailbreak a Samsung TV by allowing it to install a plugin. The first time it checks the plugin, it's legal to install. The second time it checks the plugin to actually do the installation, you provide it with a malicious one, which it thinks that it's already verified as working. Uh, this is called a time of check to time of use attack. Um, and then with some friends of mine at Eurocom and um, ETH Zurich, um, I have a, a, another project on actually backdooring a Seagate hard disk. So everything that I'm showing you today for doing either in Python on a host computer or in the firmware of an iPod, you can also do in the firmware of a serial ATA disk of desktop or server class. Um, now, you think of a disk as being a block device. Um, you think that as you write to it, you're writing to like, a specific physical location, and as you read to it, you're reading from that uh, physical location. As you get deeper into forensics, if you watch uh, Scott Moulton's lectures, you'll see that uh, there's um, complications on top of this. You have damage sectors. The damage sectors get relocated to new positions. Um, but you can go a level deeper than that, because this is actually just a computer that's speaking to your computer over a network that we call the USB or the serial ATA bus. And this is a network like any other. Um, you have addresses. You have no, down here. Uh, you have addresses. You have packets that go back and forth. They're speaking a reasonably high level protocol. Uh, if you're a good enough programmer to write a web server, you're also a good enough programmer to write a hard disk. Uh, and having written a hard disk, you can make it misbehave in any way you want. Uh, I'd like to invite you to read the fucking papers. Um, I'm tired of people asking for my slides, so I'm actually not going to publish slides unless the organizers blackmail me into it. Um, but this, the International Journal of Proof of Concept to Get the Fuck Out, you can pick up at the registration desk. And the first article in here will show you how to patch the Rockbox source code yourself to recreate the same hack that I'm going to demo today. Um, also in my blog at travisgoodspeed.com, I have descriptions for how the face dancer works. This is what was used for experimentally verifying the results in a lab before moving it to standalone hardware. Um, you should also read the paper Read It Twice by Colin Mulliner. Um, this is the Samsung television hack that I'll be explaining in a few minutes. Um, and you should read the paper that I wrote with uh, Sergey Bratis for the workshop in embedded system security in, um, in Finland this past year. You can find that at the Langsec website. Um, 
And at Axac 2013, which will be in New Orleans in December, I'll be releasing a hard disk backdoor that allows you to remotely access a hard disk through an uninfected host as a, a form of malware. Um, for prior anti-forensics work, you should look at articles by The Grug and uh, presentations by uh, David from Int80. Um, the Grug's FRAC articles are based on the situation that you have a uh, server that you've compromised. You want to keep malicious files on that server, but you're afraid that the file system is being indexed, so you need to save files outside of the file system. He shows you how to do storage in Slack space. He has user land utilities for writing into the Slack space of uh, various Unix file systems and then recovering those files later, um, and doing it in a way that they won't accidentally be deleted. Um, his tricks are now outdated, um, but they're clever. Like uh, Linux inodes used to begin at one. If you had inode zero, it would be skipped over as a test case. Um, by the mounted file system, but not by FSCK and not by the free list. So you could mark sectors as being used which I, without actually having them show up in the file system records. And it 80 began working with um, like basically ways to embarrass the forensics guy who's looking at your machine. And they're kind of childish tricks, but they're really malicious. I mean, this could really ruin a forensics examiner's day. And a lot of those same tricks you can port over to anti-forensics disks. Uh, this is the prototype of the face dancer. Um, it was part of a, a project that he did with Sergey Bratis. Um, we presented this first at Recon in 2011. Um, the idea was that the USB bus was a bus like any other. It was a network. You could access that network, and by accessing that network, you could pull all of these cheap tricks that we used to do in the 90s, like pings of death and that sort of stuff. Um, if you fuzz USB device drivers, they fall over in a second. Um, at the time that we gave this lecture, if you had 4% ends in the manufacturer name of your keyboard, that would crash Linux. Uh, if you'd like to try it now, you can download Ubuntu 12.0.0, uh, but it has to be that last .0 release and do not install updates. Um, the Face Dancer project allows you to emulate a USB device, but unlike, say, the USB rubber ducky or the Teensy, these devices are written in the host in Python. This allows you to experiment with vulnerabilities and do your fuzzing from a full machine that has all of the resources that you might need to log your results and that sort. And then only after you have a vulnerability and a proof of concept exploit do you bother porting it to run standalone on a device like the Teensy. So this is a development tool and not a deployment tool. Um, we released this last year. It, at uh, Breakpoint in Melbourne, that same year we released device firmware update emulation. So the face dancer can actually pretend to be an Ubertooth or an iPhone and accept a firmware update, giving a complete log of all of the commands that go across to perform that update. Um, I've done this to catch updates for a number of different devices. If it's not an Apple product, it's pretty much not defended. You can often replay these uh, firmware installations, and you can also replay them with patching. And the protocol isn't quite standardized enough to um, like do a one-size-fits-all implementation for it, but it's a piece of cake to replay. Um, it, at 29C3, I released mass storage emulation for the uh, face dancer. This allows you to emulate a hard disk. Um, but it does more than that, because um, in Linux and in many other operating systems, when you have a mass storage device, it's just a SCSI device that's attached externally. Okay, So um, you had SCSI scanners before you had USB scanners. Now, if you were a, a project manager at a scanner company and you were told that you had to do USB instead of SCSI, well, it kind of makes sense to just use mass storage, but a little bit differently. And when you're the Linux driver author who's told that you have to support this, it makes a lot of sense to just fork the USB mass storage driver. The problem is that that fork happened in 2001, and that version of the USB mass storage driver that was forked in 2001 is still available as a scanner driver, and you can still attach a hard disk to it. And all of the vulnerabilities that existed in the mass storage driver in 2001 are still available in this scanner driver in 2013. So these drivers that sort of sit around are just a powder keg waiting to get hit. Um, at Recon this last year, for our training, we rewrote the framework in Python 3. 
And uh, this is nice because it's a lot uh, cleaner and um, object-oriented and all of that fancy stuff. And using this library is as easy as using any other Python library. Um, you can sit down with uh, the source code to a USB driver, and you can, in an afternoon or two, write an emulator for that same device, and then begin fuzzing the device driver or exploiting it. Uh, this is the modern version of the Face Dancer. Um, this is the uh, first standalone revision. We have a newer one which also does host mode so that you can uh, study how to attack devices without having an operating system in the way. The Face Dancer is architected with two USB mini plugs, one of which runs to each host. Those are the, uh, the two things on the top. You have an FTDI chip on the left. This is the same USB to serial chip that you might solder onto your SkydogCon badge in order to make it reprogrammable directly from a computer. There's an MSP430 microcontroller. This sits in the middle. If you wanted to, you could write standalone firmware that would not require the host that would sit inside of this MSP430. But as it's used in the project, the MSP430 ferries commands back and forth between the host computer and this chip on the right, the MAX3420. That's the USB controller. This is a, a picture of the MAX3420 that I took by dissolving one of the chips in white fuming nitric acid and then um, taking a panorama through a microscope, stitching it all together and then zooming out. Uh, the nifty thing about this chip is that there's no CPU in it. Uh, this works entirely as a state machine. It was written in something like Verilog or VHDL. Um, its job is just to move buffers back and forth between the host and the face dancer. So you can program this, and you can emulate USB devices, and you get the weirdest crashes. Um, in this case, the crash is in the NVIDIA driver. Can anyone guess which USB device I was fuzzing in order to crash the NVIDIA driver? This was a keyboard. Um, if you fuzz a keyboard on a Mac, Apple, ac Apple probably fuzzed it internally, because keyboards do not crash OS X. They do crash Skype on OS X. Um, so these face dancer boards I give away for free. Um, unfortunately, even though I shipped them from Tennessee, I forgot to bring them with me. Um, so lucky for you, there's no customs delay anywhere in the States. So if you just email me a shipping address, I'll send them to you. Um, the uh, PCBs are not soldered, though, so you need to purchase the parts and assemble them yourself. Um, USB is a bit different from other networks that you might work with. Um, you have the, what you, you would call a port, in USB is called an endpoint. And you're used to ports having a specific purpose, right? Like port 80 is HTTP, port 443 is HTTPS. Um, in USB, you have far fewer ports, and they're assigned pretty much in order of use starting at one. Zero is special. Endpoint zero is the setup endpoint. This is the USB equivalent of maybe DHCP. This is how, when you plug in a mouse, the mouse can tell the host that it's a mouse without your having to edit any configuration files or um, go through any wizards or any of that garbage. Um, and this setup exchange is called enumeration. Enumeration is done by sending descriptors. And descriptors are great if you want to break things, because descriptors use nested length fields which means that it's often possible to make, um, like a, 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 for you to make a descriptor longer than itself. You can make a, a little interior part longer than the entire thing, which will allow you to read off of the end or write off of the end, which allows you to get memory corruption. And through memory corruption, you can get code execution on the host. Um, and these structures are unique to each device class. So when you have weirder devices, you have weirder descriptors, which means that you have less tested code, which makes better targets for fuzzing. Now, your class types are standardized, things like HID and mass storage. Um, so right now, my iPod is emulating both. Uh, it's HID so that when I push the button, it jumps to the next uh, slide by emulating a mouse click. Um, at the same time, there's a disk in here, and I can mount the disk over um, USB. These are both standardized classes. And a USB device can emulate more than one of them at once. 
You also have vendor specific types. These are completely unstandardized. That FTDI chip that I use in the face dancer and that can be added to your Skydocon badge, that chip is vendor proprietary. So you need to install a driver from FTDI. And the source code to that driver, uh, at least on Windows and Mac, has not been audited by the operating system team. Which means that if you have the FTDI driver for your Arduino and there's a vulnerability in the Windows version, then there's a vulnerability for memory corruption within your Windows kernel. And kernel exploits are, um, in many ways, they're easier on modern machines because the defense mechanisms that are made for user land applications haven't yet been moved over, or they're just in the process of being moved over. Also, the kernel has write privileges to user land as it's running, uh, which gives you a, a larger array of things that you can hit. Um, now, you have also have these implicit assumptions about how disks work. Um, you assume that blocks are read back in the same way that they're written. This is true for every legitimate hard disk, but it doesn't need to be true. You can violate this assumption. Um, it's also assumed that the access order does not change the meaning. So if you read file A and then file B, you, accept, you expect to get the same files as if you read file B first. That does not need to be true. It's generally assumed that these are just block devices and that as block devices, they're not going to do anything tricky underneath the hood, but there's nothing to stop you from adding it. So Colin Mulliner added some stuff beneath the hood. He was attacking a Samsung television, which was vulnerable to a time of check to time of use attack. The way that the shell script was written that actually ran inside of this TV, uh, there were two types of plugins. You could have a .swf plugin, or you could have a .so plugin. Now the .so plugin contains native code, so because it's just a Linux shared library, like a Linux DLL, which means that if you load it, well, you can just include a telnet daemon and then log into the, uh, the TV that way. And that's how the initial jailbreaks worked. So Samsung patched this vulnerability by making a new rule. And the rule was that you could only install SWF plugins from a thumb drive. .so plugins would work if they were already installed, but you could not install new ones, which is a reasonable rule set. So what Colin did was he, he looked at this shell script and said, if the plugin is .swf, then install it. And he made two different versions of the same XML file that wraps the plugin, and he included a lot of white space. So these uh, XML files were 300 megabytes apiece, almost all of which was just new lines and spaces. Um, the first time the file was read, he would present a legal .swf file, maybe Angry Birds. The TV would then know that it was an SWF file and know that it was safe to install. So the second time it read it, it would actually copy it over. And this time it would be a Telnet daemon and would allow him to drop a shell on the TV and uh, get root access. Um, he needed the 300 megabyte XML file because uh, operating systems like to cache disk accesses. Um, and if the, if the access is cached, then the operating system will only read it once, even though it's told to read it twice. And the disk doesn't have a, a choice in the matter. So again, he, he exploited this sort of a shell script. It said, if the plugin is SWF, and at that point it was, then install the plugin. And at this point, he gave it the .so, and that's how he exploited the TV. He implemented this by programming a Nokia N900 with a kernel patch. Um, this can't work without an active disk to swap the sectors. So you need to either be emulating a disk with something like the Face Dancer, or you need to be reprogramming the disk using something like uh, alternate firmware for the iPod or for a hard disk. Um, you can't do this with a standalone disk just by changing the files. <coughs> So let's build a disk. Um, to do this, you need to use USB mass storage. And USB mass storage is just a wrapper for SCSI. Um, instructions are wrapped and then sent over what are called the bulk endpoints. This might be, say, ports 1 and 2, or 3 and 4. And there's standard documentation that describes the wrappers. So when you first look up the USB mass storage standard, you're going to think that you got the wrong thing because it's only 17 pages long and most of it's bureaucratic nonsense. 
Uh, but then you realize that it's just telling you how to wrap SCSI commands. And for everything else, it tells you to look at the SCSI standards. So you've got a command block wrapper that comes from the host, and you have a command status wrapper that comes from the device. The host always speaks first. USB devices are like 19th century children. They do not speak until spoken to. And they're expected to reply in a very short amount of time. Um, also, like modern children, they can say, buzz off, I'm watching TV, and the host will allow them to get away with this a few thousand times. Um, so the success or failure comes in this command status wrapper that's at the end. So, and the data comes in the middle, which means that the success or failure has to come after all of the data is transferred. If the host asks the device for um, five megabytes of data that the device does not have, the device has to send up five megabytes of something and then complain at the end that it's useless. Um, this is annoying as hell when you have a slow USB device like the Face Dancer because you can actually time out during the transfer and not be able to get all of the data to the host before sending your error message, at which point the host will try again. Um, this, to learn about the SCSI commands, this is one of those rare events that you've heard of in history but maybe never seen firsthand, which is that the Wikipedia article is actually accurate and useful. Um, on the left, these bytes, these are the individual uh, bytes that are, are used as the command verb. So a 0, zero test to make sure that the unit is ready. If your device doesn't respond to this, then it won't work at all because the host assumes that it's broken. At the same time, if you're a host, you can ignore this command because you don't actually need to send it to the device. Um, there are other commands. 2.8 uh, and 2.a are the most useful. Those are to read and write sectors. Um, a1 is nifty. That's an ATA command pass-through. Um, sometimes the host, when you plug in a new device, will say, hey, uh, SCSI's fine, but wouldn't you rather speak ATA? Isn't that a better language for you? So um, later on, I'll show you how to detect write blockers. And what you do for those is you look for standard commands that everything supports, except for the write blocker. Because the write blockers have to do a, a whitelist instead of a blacklist in order to prevent sneaky tricks like this ATA command pass-through from allowing you to write when you're not supposed to. Um, there's also 1E, which allows you to allow or prevent removal. Uh, this is like when your CD-ROM drive refuses to eject the media. Because at the time that they wrote this standard in the 80s, no one was really sure whether, um, like how disk removal would work. Um, you had some disk drives that ejected themselves. Others had a button. It was all up in the air. So SCSI supports all of it. You can also have disks of multiple capacities in the same way that old floppy drives could be formatted to be one size or the other. Well, you can do the same thing in SCSI on a modern hard disk. Uh, the disk will ignore the command, but the command is still part of the language. And um, who knows, maybe like some version of a modern jazz disk or super floppy supports it. Um, and you have different variants. So there's different verbs for reading a sector based upon how wide the logical block address is. Because as disks became larger, they had to make um, new commands to support the larger address space. Um, these often involve complicated structures, but the structures are rather well documented, so it's not that hard to implement them. Um, and I've been meaning to look at ATA pass-through to see if any vulnerabilities exist there that might not exist in the SCSI implementation. Uh, Linux machines really like ATA pass-through, and a Linux host will ask every USB device if it would rather speak SCSI. Oh, sorry, rather speak ATA than SCSI. Now, if you want to speak SCSI, you sort of have to take baby steps because your implementation might not be good enough to make a complete disk when you start, and you need to figure out where the bugs are. The operating system won't give you very useful information. It'll just say disk not ready, disk error, read error, that sort of garbage. So instead, you need to use command line tools for raw SCSI access. Um, there's this collection called SG3utils. Um, these implement the regular SCSI commands that you're used to using, like DD, but they implement them using raw SCSI. So this allows you to uh, like use SGDD uh, to read sectors directly from the disk without passing the request through the upper layers of the operating system. You give it a SCSI controller device and you give it the SCSI address on that bus, but you do not give it a, um, 
uh, Unix block device file name because you're skipping the operating system in doing this. You can use sginc, for example, to do the um, inquiry command correctly. And sginc will give you different error messages and much more verbose ones than the operating system will give you. Um, you can also sometimes use this to read things from a disk that you're not supposed to. Um, you might want to try and see what happens if your um, block address is negative or a lot larger than it should be. So the way that it would feel like to be a disk, you're sitting there and commands start coming at you. You can never speak first, which is a difficulty when writing exploits because you have to make the host ask for whatever dangerous thing you're going to give it. Um, you can't just provide it out of the blue. After it gives you the request, you send all of the data or it sends all of the data in whichever direction. So for a write, it will send you data. For a read, you send it data. And then at the end comes your status, which tells whether it works or not. And these minimal USB wrappers are on top of SCSI, but sometimes they describe the same things. A disk has both a USB name and a SCSI name, and a file system name, and a partition name. And these names don't have to line up. Um, now, the host dialect is very distinct. Um, if you debug on Linux and you connect it to a Windows machine or to a Mac, you'll quite likely get an error or two, because um, Windows and Macs use features that Linux does not use, and Linux uses features that those other operating systems don't use. And a lot of these are his, uh, historical accidents. For example, when you plug a disk into a Windows machine, it reads the master boot record nine times. This is because uh, your block device is not cached on Windows. So when it's reading the partition table, it does separate read commands to find first how many partitions there are, and then the beginning and the end of each of the four partitions. And the host's intent is very easy to infer. When I see the master boot record being read nine times, I know that the host is trying to figure out where the partition tables are. So you can do active anti-forensics tricks inside of the disk itself. You can break undelete by wiping files as soon as they're deleted inside of the outer file system. Um, this is actually done for performance reasons of some, on some SSDs. Uh, they will parse the file system structure, recognize that you've deleted a file, and begin to zero that out, uh, because on a flash disk, erasing takes longer than writing. Um, you can do an imaging trap. So you can recognize that someone is reading your disk and reading it sequentially like a novel instead of bouncing around it like an encyclopedia. And you can do something about it. Um, in my case, I replace everything with Rick Astley lyrics. Uh, you can unlock after a timestamp. The first thing that Windows does when it mounts a partition is it writes an access timestamp. Well, if you wait for the access timestamp, that alone will tell you that you are not in a forensics lab. Uh, because if everything is being held in place to get good evidence for court, well, they sure as shit aren't going to allow it to write a timestamp to the disk. So the timestamp sort of tells you that the host is um, not following the rules of a forensics lab. Um, you can also detect write blockers, because write blockers will block more commands than they're supposed to, so they twist the dialect, almost as if, um, you know that game Telephone that uh, children play where the, um, the message gets relayed? In the same way, things get lost. Uh, but unlike Telephone, it's specific things. You don't have random corruption, you have, say, the ATA pass-through command missing, or the timestamp missing. Um, so, for those of you who remember the good old days of DOS, um, you remember that file names in DOS were eight letters and then three letters. The period is not actually part of the file name. The period is implied. And the eight bytes and the three bytes are held in different locations. Um, to delete a file, you take that A and you change it to an E5. So for the, the eight bytes being this structure in C. Uh, the upper file is not deleted, the lower file is deleted. But all the data remains. Um, so there's this uh, cunning little dastardly tool that came out in I think MS-DOS 4, maybe 5, uh, called undelete.exe that can recover these. And undelete.exe still works on um, 
the smaller capacity thumb drives on a modern machine. And we pass these thumb drives around all the time. Um, like how many uh, privately shared files hang around on that disk as you loan it to someone else to give you a file? Um, I met a, a guy at a conference, and he said, I have a problem. And I said, what is it? He said, well, um, there's a thumb drive coming around. And instead of copying the files off of it, I imaged it. I'm like, well, what did you get? He said, well, you know, I got um, the next episode of The Good Wife, and I got some confidential client files that I probably shouldn't have seen. Uh, because those were deleted, but still on the disk. And if you just take an image, you uh, can look through them at your leisure. Um, so the disk itself can actually prevent this. Um, you can zero the block files, um, or in many forms of flash memory, it's better to make them uh, Fs, when the file name itself is changed. Because you can recognize the intent of the host operating system in deleting that file. And then the disk itself can take care of wiping it. This is dangerous for other reasons. Um, one of them is that you might have a different interpretation of the file system than the host does. Um, the few disks that did funky things like this in the early thumb drive days would work great if they were formatted FAT32. And they would blow up in a blaze of glory if you formatted them EXT2. Uh, because they misinterpreted the Linux file system as being a, um, a FAT file system. Um, and, but if you do this right, it shouldn't break any file system drivers, and it's one point of patching. Um, like, I, I have a, a friend who's had something like six dozen pregnancy scares, and one vasectomy could have fixed that. You can do the same thing to the disk, right? And it's less tricky than doing a time of check to time of use attack, uh, because you don't actually need to know anything specific about the... Um, the file that's going to be undeleted, you can just prevent them all from being undeleted. You can also trap on imaging. So in a criminal forensics lab, the first step is to image the hard disk. And the disk can detect this and then erase its own contents. You can do this by block order. Uh, so legitimate accesses will follow the file system structure. Um, if the image, uh, well, imaging is linear, right? So if it's bouncing from uh, one block to some block way on the other side of the disk and then back, then it's probably a legitimate operating system accessing files and following the directory tree. Uh, imaging goes from the beginning to the end with large block requests. It keeps trying to grab larger sizes because it, it's happy to grab multiple files at once. Um, uh, could you in the back like, dim the lights for just a second? There we go. Uh, looking at these numbers, somebody yell out whether this is imaging or legit. Legit. Okay. And why is it legit? Because it's random. Right. It's not really random. It's moving all over the place. Not only that, but if you pause in it, like I, I hit return a few times in my Unix terminal to uh, add some lines, and then I accessed a specific file, setup.bat. Um, and then you can see that it's fetching 28 blocks at logical block 280. So I now know where that file is. Uh, and if you were to deconstruct the file system, you'd find it at the same place. Now, is this legit or is this not legit? Right, so it's running linearly. So if the disk does not want to be read, like this tells it that it's in a forensics lab or that some sort of um, an imaging is occurring. Um, you'll also note that the block sizes keep counting upward. Um, Occasionally, they drop back down as a performance thing or to get better alignment. Uh, but it, the last request here is 240 blocks. Um, so you're looking for sequential accesses starting at block zero. Uh, you're looking for block requests that happen in order. And you're looking for chunks of blocks that contain multiple files. And none of these things are terribly difficult to recognize. Um, you can also trap on the timestamp. So Windows writes a timestamp to the file system when it mounts it. If you see this timestamp being, uh, being written, then you know that your host is a Windows host and that it's mounting the file system instead of copying it. You can fingerprint the host. Uh, Windows will write a timestamp. Windows reads the master boot record nine times. OS X uses this weird USB command called set feature that no other operating system uses 
unless the driver specifically demands it. FreeBSD sends really, really old-fashioned uh, SCSI commands because in FreeBSD, the operating system's SCSI infrastructure is tied directly to the USB infrastructure, whereas in Linux, it's copied. OpenBSD does not pause on errors, so OpenBSD is much faster for working with um, a USB device. Um, Linux distros can be distinguished by auto mounters, so you can actually tell the difference between uh, say Ubuntu and Red Hat by whether or not it auto mounts particular file systems. And keep in mind, you're pretending to be the disk, so you can be any type of disk you want. Uh, Windows for a while had a problem with uh, auto mounter exploits running on thumb drives. So um, auto run.inf no longer works on a thumb drive, but it would work on a CD-ROM. So you'll see some commercial devices that want to automatically install a driver they appear as a CD-ROM drive instead of as a thumb drive because that allows autorun.inf to work. Um, and we're talking like uh, commercial products bypassing this policy for their, the convenience of their own users. We're not yet talking about uh, malicious device uh, authors. Um, USB write blockers are rather common in smaller forensics labs. Um, they act as a SCSI packet filter, dropping untrusted packets. Well, you can extract their rule set and then find exploitable exceptions. Um, so, like, ATA pass-through is allowed by some of them, and that allows you to switch to ATA and then um, have at it. Or, if you know that your host, by fingerprinting it, should be speaking ATA, but it's not, like a Linux host that's not asking to switch to ATA, that tells you that there's a write blocker in the way, and not just that the host hasn't decided to write to you yet. Um, there are problems with the face dancer. Uh, one of them is perfectly illustrated by this photo. Uh, it looks great, but it's stuck on a leash and it's a little bit slow. You have to have a, a host computer to actually run the Python code to emulate the device. Um, so an idea. Uh, what do you think this is? Okay, so the, this is from a Russian demotivator forum, and the, the caption is, uh, so you think this is an iPod? And the punchline is, so does my mom. <laughs> <laughs> you can reprogram the iPod through the Rockbox project. Um, so we can package this up as an iPod firmware image which has been patched to perform anti-forensics. Um, it must be lightweight and portable, and it needs to not be suspicious. So if you borrow my iPod, you won't see like, you know, my crazy signature written in the side and skulls and crossbones and uh, 31337 everywhere. Um, but what you will find is a regular Rockbox installation. You can play music on my iPod. Uh, I was listening to it on the stereo for my drive down here. Um, Rockbox includes a portable USB stack. They have built-in em emulation for USB mass storage and HID, so most of the code is already written for you. And uh, they target not only the iPod, but also SanDisk's MP3 players and other brands. And you can cross-compile to target whichever one you like. Um, so I have a, a quick little patch to a single file. Um, inside of the Rockbox firmware, you'll find USB stack slash USB underscore storage dot C. And it implements USB mass storage and SCSI uh, together. You can hook the SCSI read 10 and SCSI write 10 commands. The reads need to be hooked in two different locations because they perform double buffering. You can then blacklist a range. So um, the iPod video in some versions has 2048 byte sectors, which is rather rare. Most devices have 512 byte sectors. Um, so here, the logical block addresses are in these sizes and not in the, the smaller ones. But I just say that if the sector is um, greater than or equal to 10,000 and less than 48,000 for any request, then I trap on it and I uh, flip the tamper-protected global variable. Then I can start messing with the forensics guy. So um, here, I first wipe out the buffer by replacing it with Fs if uh, I've detected tampering. And then um, I copy this lovely little string, never going to let you down, 
There's another piece of the code that says never going to give you up. Because um, I figure if I'm going to ruin Scott's day, I should I give him a, a chuckle for it, right? Um, and then I, I detect to see the, um, I, like I only write the, um, the data back if I'm in the weaponized mode. So if I'm trying to do this for a demo, then I don't want to destroy all of my music. Um, but if I'm doing this to like, protect some super secret thing, um, then you just leave that bottom code uncommented and the disk gets wiped as the attacker is imaging it. Um, I'll do this live, I think. All right. Whee. Okay. Can you read the text? Yes. So I have uh, my disk out there. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. Shit. Now I got to get a new password. Um, <laughs> So this is the, the contents of my iPod. And I've got my music on there. I can play my music. Um, I have the International Journal of Proof of Concept to get the fuck out, which I edit. Um, I have my talks. Um, I can actually um, present the slides off of this disk. And it's nice and fast, and it doesn't have any of the problems that the face dancer has. It's also running untethered. So all of these disk accesses are working without you know, some other laptop and some um, ungangly contraption of a demo. So unmounting it. So I'm just writing this to slash dev slash null. Um, but you could just as easily write it to um, an actual file. And then I just leave this running. So the iPod now thinks that it's being read. And it's looking at the ranges that I'm reading from. And the laptop quickly passes over the blacklisted region that it has no business reading. Uh, so at this point, it's copied 52 megabytes. I forget the exact ranges that I set, but that ought to be enough. Um, <laughs> uh, so you can see, like, never going to give you up, never going to let you down. Um, and this not only would be what the forensics examiner would get in his records, but this would also be written back to the disk so that the forensics guy wouldn't get a second shot at it. Ain't that nifty? <laughs> Someone's imaging it on the forensic side, having not done a lot of forensic research myself. Are they just pretty much fire the thing up and go off and get a beer, get a cup of coffee, go come back and see if the job's done? Or are they trying to monitor the data as it's being read? Of course, if you saw this, the first thing you do is yank the cord. And well, uh, Scott, how, lo how often do forensic guys following best practice? OK. I'll be sure to add an extra line to uh, have a blacklist at the end of my desk. We do that. Every time I've done it, I go pretty blackout. Yeah, especially when people wander off and they're not going to spot that. So they come back and go. Yeah, now, like. Um, now, like any other arms race, you know, uh, Scott now has seen my example for how this particular disk works. So if he wanted to take an image, he has a special, is it a Russian tool or? 
OK, so he takes this Russian tool, and he knows to check that box to run it backward if I'm ever a subject in an investigation. Um, but like, he only knows that because like, I'm out on stage bragging about it. Um, if this were some random iPod, well, it would take a lot of effort to run all of them backward, and it's a piece of cake to patch against it on the other side. And as this rat race evolves, the attacker being the, uh, the forensics guy, for once you're the bad guy, Scott, um, the attacker only gets one shot um, because the evidence itself is destroyed if the anti forensics ang if the anti forensics trap is ever like trapped. So does your code currently know if you start this whole new build of this instead of it the beginning of this? If I started copying sequentially from you know fifty thousand instead of from zero? This demo doesn't bother. Um, I have a, a longer version that's not yet published where I'm trying to actually boot NetBSD from the iPod. Um, and it unlocks the later region as part of the boot process, sort of like port knocking, but for sectors. Um, and in that case, you wouldn't get anything. Um, and as you got frustrated and tried more things, you'd be more likely to trip. Uh, So in this model, where I'm blacklisting specific regions, probably not. In the more complicated model, where I fingerprint the host and then respond accordingly, it's quite possible that an operating system would update, would change the fingerprint so much that it would create a false positive. Um, that would be inconvenient, but <laughs> uh, you have to decide how much you care about uh, protecting your data. In, Well, I'm making a business decision that I love my Scooby-Doo theme song, and I don't want it to get erased. So I'm willing to give uh, the forensics guys a couple of extra tries uh, by not overriding it. Uh, Yeah, the, until people begin to reverse engineer disk firmware more commonly, as far as I know, there are only two teams of us that do it. Um, the uh, anti-reversing tricks aren't yet useful inside of disks. But if you're doing weaponized malware, it definitely would be. Um, and as I said in the AXAC paper that's coming out, we'll be showing how to do a weaponized backdoor in a Seagate disk for um, it's a remotely controlled Trojan horse. So if I can trick you to going to a web server that I control while your disk is running my firmware, then I can have a remote back channel to the disk and politely ask it for like a copy of ETC Shadow or whatever other file I wanted. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, sure. Uh, that happened when I was making a fake SanDisk hard disk, uh, but I was just copying their model number. I wasn't. Um, uh, for that, I was using a uh, face dancer with um, an implementation that I made in Python. You see the same thing when using Wireshark or a hardware USB sniffer? Okay, uh, so we have 45 seconds left. Um, 
So I'm going to get off the stage. Uh, but it, it was emulating an older style with 512 byte sectors. Um, I can uh, show you how to make the logs yourself if you like. But. OK, uh, thank you kindly for your time and attention. Um, please read the fucking paper. There's all sorts of good stuff in here. Um, you can learn how to um, uh, attack Bitcoin. You can learn some ELF stuff. Um, and you really ought to learn your scripture. You know. So I'm going to get off the stage now. Have fun. <laughs> so I gave you like last second. Oh, no worries. Ops is looking so like the group on schedule, so. As they should. Cool. Can you hold that? Thanks. Uh, if you could just unplug that, it's my adapter. Thank God I finally have one. What I held them is a giant steel box. It required 220 volts AC and first power supply. A little bit incompatible.